Hi, welcome to the Mohua Show. My name is Mohua Chinappa and I am an author, entrepreneur and ex-housewife. This podcast is about everything from business to technology to arts to lifestyle but done and spoken imandari se. Hi, in today's episode we have Rajesh Talwar. Rajesh is a lawyer, UN legal affairs officer and a prolific writer. Rajesh has worked for the United Nations for over 2 decades across 3 continents in numerous countries. He has written 34 books. Yes, you heard me right. He's written 34 books and which includes novels, children's stories, plays, self-help books and non-fiction work which covers issues of social justice, culture and law. We're going to talk to him today about his new title How to Kill Everyone on the Planet Ukraine and Other Recipes for a Nuclear Matricide which is a thought provoking and deeply troubling play concerning the survival of our planet in a conflict ridden world. The play uses fictional as well as real life scenarios such as the conflict in Ukraine to spark an important global debate How to Kill Everyone on the Planet is an intriguing read that takes a satirical and a philosophical look at the possibility of a tragedy beyond all others beyond all others so welcome rajesh in today's episode first let me just congratulate you on your book thank you so much mahua uh, thanks very much it's great to be connected with you and have this opportunity to speak with you 32 books is no small feat but let's come down to the book that you've just recently written the plot of the play diverts from the conventional lines and instead you have put it across in a way it offers horrific glimpses into scenarios which though fictional are almost realistically possible what made you adopt the unconventional path i wanted the, the reader to get a feel that this is really possible this is really urgent and uh, there are three episodes separate episodes where a nuclear holocaust uh, can happen incidentally i've used the word matricide instead of holocaust because holocaust is No, almost like a tired cliche it doesn't bring forth the horrific images uh, anymore so uh, so these three uh, different episodes uh, the first one involves the in- indo pak conflict potential indo pak nuclear conflict a second one involves singapore and malaysia which neither of which are nuclear powers but i go to show in that scene how uh, it can escalate into a nuclear conflict because they friends who have nuclear weapons and the third of course the current most important one is the ukraine conflict where you have a military superpower which is awash with nuclear weapons they have more than 2000 nuclear weapons which can destroy the planet multiple times so uh uh i have these aliens benevolent aliens i should add who are watching from out of space somewhere in the cosmos and they are watching the antics of us humans who are actually doing everything possible to destroy everything on the planet hence the title it's really interesting because i've never heard this title call uh, nuclear matricide i mean what made you choose this um, you know why the word matricide i think it'll be wonderful for our listeners to get to know a little bit more a little more glimpse into your heart your emotion as you use this word matricide thanks mawa Well, you know, uh, the book is actually written from somewhat of an Eastern perspective, uh, and uh, in the East, uh, in India, uh, we have historically been more democratic as compared to Western religions, which are actually quite patriarchal. Uh, in Christianity, God is always a man. I've had debates with my friends, but in India, on the other hand, God can be a man, a woman. there were many things and uh, the mother we regard with special reverence and planet earth is actually our mother uh, killing your father is somehow not nearly so horrific an act as killing one's mother even to speak the words you know it brings up oh my god how can you even talk about it so so matricide is probably one of the most unspeakable crimes you can think of and our planet is really our mother you know it is looking after us with so much care it is sending us fruits it is sending us crops it is giving us clean air to breathe and we are desecrating our mother 
so so i feel and there is a scene in the play where uh, uh mother earth is represented by a devi and the children are you know taking away things somebody wants the ruby somebody wants the emeralds and the mother is giving everything she's giving all uh but the greedy children that represents us our short sighted humanity uh, we are doing everything to destroy her i am just so moved that i don't know how else to go on to the next question because it is amazing to hear this perspective because it's a word that you know in spite of me being a writer and an author i don't think i've ever used this word so you've really touched a chord with me so you know let's talk about war of course i mean we've seen some horrific uh, footages of ukraine and you know, my heart bleeds there was this grandmother who was crying of for her house of over years and years that was nothing but rubble that was left so we all know that in war there are no winners you know so what is often left behind is always suffering destruction and death you know so why do you think countries actually go to war uh, thanks for uh, you know i've the you and i have uh, spent much of my life in war zones in afghanistan somalia liberia east timor and i think it's the greed uh, and it's the short sightedness uh and uh, nobody is innocent i mean uh, i have always been against communists and against capitalists both because i think uh, uh, both of them have created enough destruction on the planet uh, the west they have their democratic rights but their foreign policy is very hypocritical uh, they take care of their own populations because they want to win their elections uh, but they will give in to lobbies corporate lobbies arms lobbies pharma lobbies uh, which are all out to make money which are greedy uh, which uh, so uh, i think uh, it's a case of greed uh, trumping the softer human human emotions uh, it's not realizing that we are all in this together uh, i think i could i give the simile in my play of uh, that there is actually a snake uh, which exists which eats itself it doesn't realize it sees its tail and it thinks this is some other creature and it starts eating its tail uh and greedily dev- devouring its own tail but then it does reach a point when it realizes oh this is myself uh and i think we humans we are like that snake but unfortunately we may not be even as wise as that snake we may kill ourselves before we realize uh it's interesting that when i was thinking of a title for this play you know uh i spent a few days thinking because i wanted something very striking and then i thought of how to kill everyone on the planet and then i thought oh this is such an obvious title because we've been trying to do this for decades uh, some other author must have surely taken it uh, then i googled and i was astonished that nobody has yet taken it i said Oh my god this is so strange such an obvious title because we've been doing this for decades i could kill ourselves kill everyone on the planet uh, but it's not there so uh, we are greedy we hide our own greed from ourselves uh, we are hypocritical we don't look at ourselves uh, with honesty because i was thinking about dante and i you know you have spoken in your um, play about heaven and hell that's created by god and in the very first scene of the play so we have this notion of good deed uh, being rewarded by god and bad deeds being punished which is inculcated right from the start right so how far do you think it has persuaded human beings to mend their action do you think it really you know when we think about good and bad and we think about punishment and uh, redemption do you think human beings in today's uh, world even think about all these things uh well it's interesting that you mentioned the scene because actually god uh in the very first scene uh saint peter because it's a christian god saint peter comes to him in a panic uh it's the time of the hiroshima nagasaki bombings and god says what's ha- what's happened why in such a panic everything okay in heaven he says you know it's going to i don't have enough staff to decide who i'm going to send to hell or i'm going to send to heaven because so many people are coming and god says what is the problem we've had pestilences before we have had epidemics before and we've always been able to sort out the good eggs from the bad eggs and send them to hell or heaven this is yes but it has never happened before and this is the first with hiroshima and with nagasaki that so many hundreds of thousands of people have all died 
within the space of a few minutes. So he says, I'm just overwhelmed. Uh, there are so many souls, how do I sort them out? So God himself is frustrated. And uh, no spoilers here, but you know, in, in one scene towards the end, he's saying, he tells himself that maybe the hell which I have created, uh, humans have surpassed me. Uh, because with this, these nuclear bombs going off, they have created a hell that even I could not dream of. So, so we are moving towards a hell-like situation where uh, robots might press nuclear buttons and bombs might start getting detonated uh, and uh, the planet may be set on fire. Without being alarmist, uh, I'll refer to a Chicago professor, John Mearsheimer, who is a world authority on how great powers behave. And he says, it's a cash-22 situation right now in Ukraine, because if Russia wins, then the idea of national so sovereignty gets undermined, which is so very important. But if L Russia starts to lose, you never know with President Putin, he could, he's an erratic man, he could push a button. And uh, then the button might involve a response, and then, you know, we don't know what we're looking at for Europe and for the rest of the world. It's really frightening to think about that. But, you know, I want to ask you, when you've spoken about benevolent aliens, why do you think that, you know, you've introduced aliens? Do you believe that human beings are incapable of being benevolent when you put together your story and your play? Um, why would you think of an alien, to, uh, you know, to be benevolent? Um, are you very jaded with the things that you see around you? Well, yes. Uh, let me... Uh, uh, the aliens who are watching are benevolent, but they are also malevolent aliens. In fact, there's a group of malevolent aliens who, aliens who decide to colonize Earth. And uh, just like you're asking, one of them says, we are, we are also you know, benevolent-minded, uh, so why are you being so hostile to us? And he asks him a few questions. He says, are you really that benevolent? How have you treated your own species? You're killing and slaughtering them. How do you treat the... Aborigines in the Americas, how did you treat them in Australia? Did you not exterminate them? Did you not enslave the African Americans, millions of them? He says, forget this is your own species, but how have you treated the other species? Haven't you put them in cages? Aren't you calling the, causing the extinction of so many species? Aren't you uh, showing great brutality with regard to their treatment, keeping them in cages, keeping them uh, in inhuman conditions. So, uh, we congratulate ourselves on being human and humane. But if an alien were to ask us, how do we humans treat other humans? How do we humans treat other species on the planet? Why do we arrogate to ourselves the kind of monopoly that we can eat everybody else and nobody can eat us? If a tiger eats us, and of course, Horrible, horrible beast. Um, we are eating billions of. Uh, and this, uh, this outside, this alien, is not only planet, but the only uh, animals which are surviving on the planet are the ones that you want to eat or the ones that satisfy your craving for love, uh, which are pets we keep. So dogs, cats, and other pets, they survive, and the ones that we eat, they will survive because we need to eat them. But otherwise, we are not very benevolently disposed. It's amazing that you, you know, you make me actually start to think about how sometimes, you know, we, we start thinking that we are really greater in the species uh, around us, but actually we are all survivors and in our own way, always looking at our own selfish means. So, you know, how much do you think about technology? I mean, do you think technology today is really debilitating our lives in many ways? Because one can't deny that today the world is changing. And, you know, even this podcast that I'm doing with you, we need technology to be with one another, but it comes in with its own vices. It It's a bane and a boon, you know. Um, so how much of a bane would you call this and how much of a boon would you call this? Uh, well, I think uh, the technology itself... Uh is in a sense neutral and it can be a source of great good, uh, which it is, I mean, in terms of the medical cures, in the terms of the comforts which we enjoy. Uh, but it's really 
the potential misuse of technology, which you see in these wards. Uh, you have these drones, which are being operated by somebody sitting in Arizona, thousands of miles away. And they're, 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 they see a wedding taking place in Afghanistan. Uh, and they mistake the celebratory gunfire for uh, the Taliban doing uh, shooting practice. And they drop a bomb in which everybody in that wedding is massacred. And the papers reported as collateral damage that, oh, you know, these are wars uh, with decadent, uh, with uh, obscurantist, medieval minded rogues. Uh, collateral damage has to happen. Uh, so we, we don't really. Uh, question ourselves on whether in handling, uh, I'm of course not a supporter of the Taliban, but I do question very seriously the methods which the international community has used uh, to fight this war, which has put civilian populations at great risk. Absolutely, I agree with you on that completely, Rajesh, yes. But you know, when you have spoken about something so serious, I mean, we've spoken about wars, we've spoken about how humans are dehumanized and, you know, we are incapable really of feeling for one another, you know, but you've also added humor. I mean, what was the reason that you added wit and humor? Is it because it inspired you to do that? You think it's more effective in driving home the message, uh, you know, on something as serious a narration as uh, narration as your um, title? Well, you know, I think it's because uh, even when you, because messagey plays or preachy plays, they don't get a, the message across either to adults or to children. So, everybody, nobody wants a moralizing play. Nobody wants a lecture that, oh, you're such, you're so terrible. But uh, humor can sometimes wake us up and make us realize, oh my God, you know, this is what I'm doing. Uh, I am really that snake who is eating its tail. Uh, and when you think of the snake, of course, it's funny. Uh, it's so stupid. Uh, and when you think of yourself, uh, suddenly it's not so funny. Uh, I think uh, humor is a very poignant weapon to wake people up, uh, to raise consciousness. And uh, so uh, an unrelenting seriousness, uh, nobody can put up with it. I mean, I think I would find <laughs> it difficult also, you know. Yes. You've also personified, uh, you know, Mother Earth as Devi, you know, mother who keeps on giving to her children regardless of her own discomfort. And with all the conferences held worldwide with regards to climate change and sustainability, do you think there's really a ray of hope left in humanity? Because sustainability, again, is such a, you know, it's, it's, it's a topic that everybody's talking about, but few of us can really follow because it's really into our systems, into the food that we eat, into the clothes that we wear, into, you know, everything that we are handling. So I kind of personally don't talk too much about sustainability because I know that I will not be able to lead that life, you know. And uh, so coming back to this question of mine, I mean, how much do you think that um, this can really be imbibed by humanity, you know, of protecting Mother Earth? Well, you know, I think, uh, in fact, uh, one of the aliens uh, in this group says that should we cause a small nuclear accident somewhere? <laughs> and the other aliens are horrified. What do you mean? Uh, you know, thousands of people are going to die. He says, yes, but you know, these human species, they don't seem to wake up uh, until some until and unless something happens. Uh, so maybe uh, a few thousand people dead will be better than the entire planet exploding. So unfortunately, the situation is that we have woken up in the past. We have these great human rights treaties, great conventions, Geneva conventions, and particular see their timing, they came after the world wars. So the barbarism of the world wars where hundreds of thousands of people were killed, we were killing our own in the so-called most civilized part of the planet, uh, that is Europe. So at that time, I think Gandhi was asked, what do you think of Western civilization? And he said, I think it's a very good idea, uh, meaning, of course, that they are not civilized, but it would be a great idea if they became civilized. Uh, and just that you have technology, you have weapons of mass destruction, other dangerous weapons doesn't mean any, has anything to do with civilization. So, uh, uh, now with the, all these uh, all these tragedies, Hiroshima and Nagasaki that woke people up to the dangers. So, sometimes I do think, horrific though the idea 
might appear to be that the aliens may not be wrong that if there is a small incident, see what happened after Chernobyl. Chernobyl woke people up yes, to the dangers of nuclear power. So did the Fukushima incident in Japan. So maybe if there is a small repeat, uh, I would, or maybe just an incident which could potentially kill people, and then we will have people on the streets, you know, cities across the planet demanding an end to how business is being done, both from a, having these endless wars and also from an ecological perspective. Because right now there are people, civil society across the world is making demands, but the urgency is not there. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't know whether we, we can wake up without it actually happening. You know, most of us, we are human beings when we buy the inverter only when the lights go off. Uh, we don't do power planning. And then, uh, uh, so maybe, uh, maybe we are doomed to wait for something a little terrible to happen before we suddenly wake up. Uh, all these human rights treaties came into being just after the world wars, when we, when people were seeing the horrific nature of our own humanity, and maybe something terrible needs to happen. I pray that it doesn't. That's very frightening, Rajesh, for me to think about it because you know I've read so much and seen so much footage and films, you know, on the Holocaust and the Auschwitz camp, and you know all those things really stay back with you as to how human beings can treat another human being. It seems impossible, and uh, sincerely, I really hope we all wake up before that. But you know, there's like I said that you know as writers, we are always moved by some things that really touch us. In one line from Anne Frank's diary that she, uh, that she wrote, you know, she wrote that I can shake off everything as I write my sorrows disappear, my courage is reborn. So to all authors and to all writers and, uh, you know, to all artists and the human rights people who are, you know, tirelessly working towards, um, you know, a recognition of what is happening around three cheers or cheers and salute to all of them who are tirelessly doing things. And especially uh, for all our listeners today, please uh, do look out for this book, by Rajesh Talwar that says how to kill everyone on the planet, Ukraine and other recipes for nuclear matricide. It's an extremely thought-provoking and deeply troubling play that will make all of us think. Thank you so much, Rajesh, and keep the pen going. As they say, the pen is mightier than the sword. And uh, we look forward to more titles from you. Let me say what a pleasure it has been to talk to you. And let me also thank you for using uh, this technology in the, one of the most benevolent and positive ways possible to send such a good message and thank you also for uh, conducting this conversation in the way you did uh, because uh, uh, there was so much empathy and I think that, you know uh, you combine being an author yourself uh, with being be able to bring the best out of somebody who's talking with you so thank you very much thank you so much Rajesh to you, our dearest listeners, you can find us on your favorite streaming services, Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Podcast, and of course, on all other major streaming services. With loads of love, we are The Mohua Show, where we talk imandari se.